My name is Sandesh Reddy. I'm a chef restauranter. Apart from cooking food, I, I work with uh, completely scalable, sustainable farms and try and incorporate them into my, my, my cooking. What do you mean when you say completely sustainable farms? Like most people work anywhere between high crop production and uh, low yield formats like organic cultivation. Um, you're either up there or down there. The problem with either one of them is when you go into your high, high volume production based formats, you're never going to be able to fully understand and fully let the land recover in time for next crop cycle. And that kind of kills the whole purpose of cultivation. So every crop year on year is going to be not much less nutritious till it comes to a point where all the nutrients are literally sucked out of the earth and you have lousy tasting tomato if you're growing tomato continuously in the same place the same way without letting you know nature recover itself. On the other hand you have and that of course is obviously compensated with tons and tons and tons of pesticide and, fer and you know fertilizer which eventually finds its way into the into the crop itself. And the other, and the other extreme of it is organic cultivation. India has a population of 1.3 billion people. And if you do, if you get like lousy crop yield in an already logistically deprived uh, country and in a place where you know cultivation is becoming a huge challenge, I think we're literally wasting a precious resource. So we're trying to find that balance and try and make sure that we have a, a fully functional, sustainable, you know, farming practice that we're trying to encourage, like adopting farms and saying we'll buy all of the produce. We've been working extensively with a couple of cyclic crop production routines between farms. So at any point in time, our not just our restaurants, but there are other restaurants that work with us for sourcing are completely taken care of and there's a sustainable produce that reaches them on a continuous basis. And most, most often when you don't have like the ideal crop cycle, there is something that goes missing as in you'll have great tomatoes for six months and then six months you have nothing. So to try and make sure that there is a consistent and continuous supply, we try and work with you know, multiple farms and do their planning for them and production and stuff. You run a couple of restaurants by yourself. Yes. Do you all, all of your restaurants are fed by this farmland? Yeah, um, see, it's okay. the entire sourcing is just one unit. So it's literally, uh, we have a consolidation space where they get all of the produce, it's segregated and sent to the rest of the restaurant. So it's literally one area that segregates resources. So all of the inputs come into that one space. Yeah. So you gave a talk this morning about, you know, when, when people come into restaurants, how, how they are actually conditioned about what they are going to eat and how it's going to be served and how it's going to taste. And you actually arguing a bit against it. Why? I, what are your thoughts? I don't think I'm, I don't think it's literally an argument. It's yeah. more, it's more uh, a preconceived notion that people have about the way certain foods have to taste. I mean, there is obviously no real creative freedom given to the chef in any sense whatsoever. Uh, I mean, I completely respect the fact that, you know, steak should taste like steak and not like chicken. I mean, I completely understand that and I respect that. But what I'm trying to say is, is it's as simple as saying, you know, you, why should fish always be cooked? You're ordering fish. I mean, there are beautiful other ways of curing and slow cooking. And I think also, I also come to understand culturally that there have been issues around me that have probably triggered this off. And I've kind of related this in some way to every other culture that I've been associated with, either eating there, dining there, or cooking there. Mm. And take the Span Spanish food, for example, tapas. It's almost you know, written that it has to be done a particular way. I mean, there are purists who go to El Bui and who come back and say, oh, no, I don't want to eat food that, that doesn't taste like food. That is food. It's, in fact, more natural. The quality of produce is so much better than your average mm -hmm. street vendor. But then there are people who completely shun the idea. And there are quite a few chefs who are really, really pushing that envelope and making sure that people get to taste real food without having to be prejudiced about how it should look, feel, or, or you mm. know. So how do you translate this as a cook in your own restaurant? Um, 
we don't entirely take everything that we have, throw it out of the window and say, you know what, the steak is going to taste, I mean, it's going to be like a paper that you can wrap around your pencil and eat it, nibble on it. That's not what I'm saying. It's taking those preconceived notions, using them as reference points. Like I gave an example of a shmore or pina colada or, you know, guacamole. I mean, you get all the essences right. See what you can do with it. See how you can keep that flavor com component still in it, yet give them a completely new experience that when they close their eyes, when they eat that dish, let them think of the original one. That way they're probably kind of going to break into a completely realm of different thought when they eat something as simple or, you know, articulate as a chicken tikka masala. Mm -hmm. So what if it doesn't have Campbell's tomato soup in there? I mean, that's traditionally how it was made. Chicken tikka masala is not even an Indian dish. Mm. It was invented in the UK. So, mm. if we were to do it right, if I say I'm going to avoid Campbell's tomato soup, I'm just going to use real tomatoes, doesn't mean it's not a chicken tikka masala. So, that's what I'm trying to say. So, I think you need to start off with just those little changes in the way we perceive food and then you know, turn into something else. How do the customers react? What is, what is the feedback you get from your customers? Uh, we played it very, I mean, I, I think I was a little brash when I started off three and a half years ago. We threw a curveball at every customer that walked in. We said, you know, we do what we wanted to do. It's our restaurant and whatever. I think it was just being an arrogant 24-year-old 24, 24 cook. But it came to a point where I realized that, you know, your food is only as good as your customers. So I started reworking that menu, reworking the thought and the concept that, you know, my, my audience isn't ready for what I'm doing yet. So we kept a portion of the food, tasty, convincingly familiar food, and we turned, we added a couple of components to that whole mix, which were completely different. So after a customer got bored of eating a particular dish, they might want to try it. And if, if they like it, then that's mm. what they go back to ordering the next time. Mm. Does this mean higher prices for, for the customer? Um, I, I don't think price is really a, an issue here with trying, trying to create food like this. It's more to do with the way you handle it. Like, you can make vodka pani puris and it literally don't cost anything more than making a regular pani puri yeah. and drinking a shot of vodka on the side. Yeah. Or, you know, jalebis that are soaked in baileys. Or you have drink. So the point is when you sometimes put two uh, components that you won't ideally relate to in a particular dish, Perspectively, it looks a little more expensive, mm. but it's not necessarily more expensive than you trying to eat it separately. Yeah, um, yeah but what what sometimes it, you know ends up happening is when you have um, ingredients that are hard to source, and you know they're, that they're hard to find, and we tr when we incorporate those into our menu, and they are of course going to be more expensive than conventional meat that's available off the shelf or you know vegetables yeah. that have just been mass produced. Yeah, from that sense, they might be probably a little more expensive. And I think it's important that there's somebody that's doing things a little differently. So, and you need to start somewhere. I'm not saying you need to raise the prices for just serving rubbish. But mm -hmm. if, you're, if there is honesty in what you're serving and if it does demand a slightly higher price to say you're a sustainable business, then I... Then I guess yeah. I mean, I just completely justified in charging that much more. Yeah. So my last question would be: What make what made you go this way? Why did you start this? I'm completely self-taught. I went to engineering school, so I didn't have any preconceived notions or baggage that everybody else was doing. So this is the way I looked at it so from the beginning. So you're a hobby cook, more or less. Uh, yes and no. I don't think I've been a very successful cook as I was a baker, but then cooking is definitely what I love doing, but baking is what I'm known for. So okay. either way, it started off as doing feeding myself what I wanted to eat. That's literally how it started, not even a hobby. It came out as a necessity. When I travel, I eat lovely things all around the world and come back to, you know, Chennai and you can't find that familiarity. So that's when mm -hmm. I started baking or cooking things that I wanted to eat, and that's what I did. Okay. So what do you like best? What do you... What is your most favorite food? Anything raw. I love raw food. I eat anything, but especially raw food is my favorite food. So I think Japanese food is up there for me. Okay. Because they're tremendous respect for the produce and the way they handle 
you know, the way they handle produce and everything. It's, it's a really intense food culture. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm 